viewed nuns as, quote, more obedient and less likely to question their authority. And the work of Catholic women religious um, as nurses during the Civil War helped to improve their standing in the United States during its time of anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant um, sentiment. And as a result, people often turn to Catholic sisters to help care for the sick. Uh, next slide, please. So Arkansas became a state in June 1836. And throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, Arkansas was still a developing frontier area with a reputation for deplorable health. Uh, this was a setting where people had to rely primarily on their own knowledge to resolve health issues within their families or communities. And the responsibility for caring for sick patient, or sorry, sick family members uh, tended to be left mostly to women who gained informal experience in nursing by learning to care for others as children. Uh, midwifery, for example, was one of those skills that was passed on by other women. But without the availability of proper medical training, uh, the mortality rate of new mothers and infants due to complications from labor were very common during this period. Modern medical foundations uh, began being laid in Arkansas with the establishment of a medical licensing board following a yellow fever outbreaks in the 1870s. Um, also during the latter part of the century, uh, the first hospital in Arkansas was founded in 1887 in Fort Smith. Um, 1888, the second hospital, St. Vincent's, was founded in Little Rock. A third hospital founded in Hot Springs. And there was also a small sanitarium established in Pocahontas, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, Arkansas got its first training school for nurses in Fort Smith in 1895. And um, other than Fort Smith, other options for nursing training for lay women, especially in Northeast Arkansas, included St. Louis and Memphis. Uh, by 1912, early 20th century, uh, the Arkansas State Nurses Association was organized, followed by state legislation the following year, uh, which regulated the practice of nursing. And by 1914, about 14 hospitals throughout the state offered courses in nursing. Next slide, please. So again, during this period, people often turned to Catholic sisters to help care for the sick, especially in these more rural areas like Arkansas. And this was no different for the Olivet and Benedictine sisters of Jonesboro, who, uh, experience, whose experience with nursing began in the late 19th century. The uh, Olivet and Benedictine order originated in the canton of Unterwalden, Switzerland. And the congregation um, immigrated to the United States as part of that wave of European Catholic immigration in the mid 19th century. And they settled first in Maryville, Missouri, and then later moved uh, to Pocahontas, Arkansas to the and established Convent Maria Stein, as you see in that top photo there, in December, 1887. Their presence in Jonesboro actually began with the establishment of St. Roman School in May 1888. Uh, their primary mission during this period was teaching. And then nine years later, um, as a result of contracting typhoid fever from contaminated drinking water, and also because of the arrival of the railroads, uh, the novitiate and convent of Maria Stein was officially relocated to Jonesboro. And then Holy Angels Convent, as you see in the middle photo there, was officially dedicated on July 10th, 1898. Uh, the sisters actually faced more primitive conditions in Jonesboro than they encountered in Pocahontas because Pocahontas was already an established river town and Jonesboro was an up and coming developing railroad town at the time. 
So the sisters worked hard uh, to furnish their newly constructed convent and they cleared the surrounding land to accommodate a garden, a grape arbor to make um, a serum, uh, wine and an orchard and eventually cows and chickens in order to feed their community. Uh, their initial undertakings in healthcare came in the form of nursing as a result of epidemics, again, following that trend during the period. Um, the local population in Jonesboro actually requested help from the sisters. And so in response, the sisters began caring for the sick. And again, because the nearest healthcare facilities at the time were located far away in Memphis, Little Rock or St. Louis. So there was originally a hospital planned for Jonesboro, but that project was abandoned after a fire in May 1896, which destroyed a large section of buildings on Kate Street, including the original St. Romans Church and School. Um, but there was also a spinal meningitis epidemic uh, that broke out around Pocahontas. So in response, the sisters opened a small hospital or sanitarium, which they named St. Anna's Infirmary in October, 1898. And this infirmary remained operational until January, 1902, when it was closed because the spinal meningitis epidemic subsided and also because there was a lack of funds to keep it running. Next slide, please. So in the late, um, 19th century, sorry, uh, Northeast Arkansas suffered a malaria epidemic as well. And because of this, Father Eugene Weibel, who was the appointed priest for the area, sort of revived this idea of establishing a hospital in Jonesboro. So he got permission for this endeavor from Bishop Fitzgerald, who was the head of the diocese. But despite receiving the bishop's permission, Father Weibel still had to convince the Olivet and Benedictine sisters to expand their ministry to include nursing. Um, according to sisters Agnes, or Sister Agnes Voth and Sister Henrietta Hoppel, the Olivet and Benedictine sisters strongly opposed Father Weibel's project and argued that, quote, they were founded primarily to be adorers of the Blessed Sacrament, not nurses, and they engaged in the ministry of teaching simply as a means of supporting themselves. Uh, Father Weibel countered by arguing that there was a precedent for the sisters to take on nursing as part of their ministry. And to illustrate this, he pointed to the founder of their order, St. Benedict, who had devoted his life to caring for the sick. And Father Weibel also used Maria Rickenbach, Rickenbach Convent back in Switzerland, uh, the sister's home convent, which was known for providing accommodations for pilgrims and guest houses that did eventually evolve into hospitals. And moreover, Father Weibel argued, uh, the Olivet and Benedictine Sisters of Jonesboro were not cloistered nuns, so the Council of Trent did not prohibit them from providing health care assistance to the local community. So after this back and forth, uh, the sisters eventually did agree to add health care to their teaching ministry, and they immediately began fundraising. Uh, Father Weibel did contribute the first $500. And the sisters uh, gathered, or they garnered local interest in the project by distributing circulars, while Father Weibel conducted a series of lectures to help promote the hospital. Uh, Jonesboro physician, Dr. Charles M. Lutterlow and other community leaders became particularly interested in the project and helped to raise funds for the new hospital by making donations and sub securing subscriptions, door-to-door uh, -door donations from other Jonesboro residents. Uh, once the, an appropriate amount of funds were raised, 
the sisters purchased a house near their convent on East Matthews from a photographer named W.L. Robinson. And it had six rooms, which the sisters furnished with cots and covered orange crates. And they named it St. Bernard's. And it officially opened as a nonprofit healthcare institution on July 5th, 1900. And you can see that original building in the top photo there. Uh, St. Bernard's opened with eight local doctors, including Dr. Lutterlow as staff physicians. Um, patients were admitted at all times, day or night, and both Catholics and non-Catholics received care on equal terms. The only people who were not admitted were children under the age of two and those with, quote, contagious, syphilitic, alcoholic, and mental diseases. Uh, Sister Aloysia Unterberger, uh, who, who had received nursing education back in Switzerland, and was in charge of St. Anna's in Pocahontas, was named superintendent of St. Bernard's. And other sisters chosen to work in the hospital learned accepted medical uh, techniques for the time from the doctors who practiced there and they quickly set themselves up as supervisors. So immediately they're setting themselves up as also being in charge of this hospital. Uh, the sisters uh, quickly assumed growing responsibilities for actually caring for the patients. And they took this new mission seriously. And so some of them invested in developing additional skills by traveling to St. Joseph's Hospital in Memphis to receive further training. Um, in addition to caring for patients, uh, the sisters were also responsibility for the hospital's cleanliness, uh, which, uh, some of the local residents in Jonesboro were not sure why that was necessary. And in fact, the very act of bathing patients often became confused with baptizing them, which was a misunderstanding that illustrated a much larger issue um, of the local community's confusion about the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, so in addition to these responsibilities, the sisters also prepared food and washed laundry for patients um, and also for the convent. Uh, they uh, set service fees for St. Bernard's at a dollar a day. Uh, surgical costs ranged from $2 to $5. Uh, physician's fees were extra. Although many of the patients cared for at St. Bernard's were actually charity patients, and a lot of those patients ended up paying for the, their services by bringing the sisters food. Uh, patients were also allowed to solicit the services of any physician in good standing while receiving care at St. Bernard's. And the sisters also helped fund operations, um, again, through solicitation tours, uh, going door, door to door, and also by selling hospital tickets, like you see in that center photo. Uh, they sold these to the workmen in the logging camps surrounding Jonesboro. Uh, prices for these tickets ranged, for, ranged from a dollar for admission to the hospital and care for one day, and all the way up to $9 for a ticket that would be good for a whole year. Uh, they also raised funds by holding raffles to sell in embroidered hand pieces and laces that they produced. And they continued to employ these methods uh, to finance hospital operations and also to finance um, construction for new buildings for several decades. So with only six rooms, uh, St. Bernard's was obviously cramped from the beginning, uh, but it underwent its first expansion in January 1901 in response to the ever-growing need for more beds. So the sisters purchased a second house, um, expanding the number of bedrooms to 20. And they connected this second property to the original property with a one-story interspatial annex. That same year, St. Bernard's, 1901, St. Bernard's was actually desegregated, 
which of course in the midst of the Jim Crow era was a matter of contention among the local community and also among the majority of the white Protestant physicians who practiced at St. Bernard's. So um, a landslide in the local limestone quarry uh, killed several African-American workers and injured many others. Uh, sources tend to credit Dr. Lutterlow for bravely and compassionately bringing these patients to receive care at St. Bernard's. Again, because that facility was the only one close enough with the necessary amenities. But despite this, Dr. Lauderlow still had to get the sisters' consent to bring those patients into the hospital. Uh, the sisters did consent to admit and care for these patients and Jonesboro residents didn't like it. And they responded by sending threats to burn the hospital down, which they were serious, but thankfully did not come to fruition. And ultimately they did nothing to prevent the sisters from nursing the quarrymen at St. Bernard's until they recovered. Uh, however, this was a task that the sisters shared with Dr. Lauderlow alone because all the other physicians resigned because of this for a time. Uh, according to available sources, these physicians uh, did gradually return to minister to, or to care for patients of both races, but not for a while. And although African-American patients continued to receive care at St. Bernard's from this point on, there was a separate, quote, Negro wing created to keep those patients separate from white patients, although still under the care of white physicians until the institution was legally desegregated roughly 60 years later. Uh, contemporary newspaper articles show that St. Bernard's Hospital was a successful and flourishing institution that was efficiently managed by the Benedictine sisters. Indeed, by 1904, uh, only four years after opening, uh, the sisters and the physicians they employed had cared for about 2,000 patients, with 500 of those being charity patients. And St. Bernard's was at the start of another expansion to include more patient rooms. Um, indeed, a separate building was constructed uh, to house a steam heating, steam laundry, and bake, uh, bakery, as well as the necessary mechanical equipment to operate those services. Uh, this building was later used um, as low cost rooms for poorer and charity patients and even as isolation at various times. Uh, by December 1905, an additional brick expansion was completed and ready for use, which you can see that expansion in the bottom photo. Uh, the new annex, uh, was accompanied by the construction of a powerhouse, a laundry, and a bakery that served both the hospital and the convent. And this new laundry also provided another means of income for the sisters as they began doing laundry for the local hotels and barbershops to help cover um, those hospital expenses. And Although the sisters' presence and services were welcome because of the demand for their skills in caring for the sick and as well as teaching, um, that anti their religious bigotry, um, along with jealousy and suspicion, soon re reared their heads. Jonesboro residents at the time were still mostly ignorant of the teachings and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, except for those superstitions and stereotypes that they may have learned growing up. And there was an apparent widespread belief that St. Bernard's Hospital was actually owned by the Roman Catholic Church and that its real purpose was to indoctrinate the citizens of Jonesboro in order to help spread Catholicism throughout Arkansas and eventually throughout the country. And this was a sentiment that was not exclusive to Jonesboro, as Protestants throughout America at the time generally believed that nuns were more interested in saving souls than bodies or proselytizing to their patients. 
in order to gain converts. Um, however, uh, St. Bernard's is actually a rare example of a charitable institution that was owned, in, uh, owned by the sisters who funded and staffed it. And as one historian has shown, Catholic women religious in America, quote, often did not own the schools and charitable institutions they funded and staffed with hard labor and self-sacrifice, and they might lose them in a quarrel uh, with the ecclesiastical or secular authorities who did. Again, this is not the case in Jonesboro. And although their services were largely volunteered without their prior consent by Father Weibel, the Olivet and Benedictine sisters uh, stood their ground and they refused to allow either Father Weibel or even the Protestant male physicians of Jonesboro to sort of elbow them out of the way completely and take over their institution. So despite initial opposition to taking on a nursing ministry and more debt, the Olivet and Benedictine sisters faced these challenges head on, uh, thus proving their ability to persevere within the hospital marketplace and also proving their skills as savvy bu business managers. Um, so all of this uh, suspension, suspicion among the local community ultimately led to proposals for a new healthcare institution operated solely by the Protestants of Jonesboro. Uh, promotions for a Protestant hospital began in October 1905, uh, led by Reverend Thomas of the First Baptist Church. And some of the prominent physicians and businessmen in Jonesboro soon backed the proposal because they immediately considered the construction of a Protestant hospital as an opportunity for a good investment for the local Protestant churches in the city. And again, this reflected a prevailing belief that St. Bernard's was a profit generating institution that the Roman Catholic Church owned. Uh, the Protestant hospital uh, would be run collectively by the Protestant denominations in Jonesboro and staffed by Protestant nurses. And a man named Minor Markle selected and purchased the 12 room Davis house on South Church Street to be converted into what was called the Oak Home Sanitarium. And thank you, Tim, for going ahead and advancing to this next slide. Um, if you look on the map, Matthews runs horizontally, uh, roughly in the center. And you can see the St. Bernard's uh, complex in the right there. A uh, church street runs vertically down the center and Oak Home would have been located off of this map, but still in relatively close proximity to St. Bernard's. So investors immediately renovated this new facility to make divisions within the existing rooms, um, also to construct an addition, which created a new total of 22 rooms, and to lay brick walls around the building, essentially trying to catch up to the size of St. Bernard's. Um, the Oak Home Sanitarium opened on Christmas Day with a housewarming party hosted by Jonesboro's Protestant ladies. Uh, many of whom were members of local women's organizations. And it should also be noted that the 21 member board of directors consisted both of Protestant church leaders as well as local businessmen who specifically planned to run Oak Home like a business. And this clearly meant that this new hospital would, was thus owned and operated by white male Protestant leaders of the community who fully expected large returns on their investment rather than a group of foreign Catholic women. So local Protestant women were also heavily involved in supporting Oak Home Sanitarium um, through or by organizing and hosting donation parties, where they also provided the entertainment. And these Protestant women were included in hospital operations as well, but not on the same level 
as the Olivet and Benedictine sisters at St. Bernard's and definitely not on the same level as the white male Protestant board of directors. Uh, so instead, the board of directors relegated Protestant women to a strictly subordinate role at Oak Home uh, when they decided to create a ladies auxiliary to assist the male members. Um, Oak Home Sanitarium's managers ultimately did decide to include a ward to service the African-American citizens of Jonesboro, uh, but this was likely a result of uh, prevalent racist taboos against white doctors caring for black patients at the time. So sometime between December 22nd, 1905 and January 23rd, 1906, uh, Oak Holmes directors offered the use of two rooms in the hospital to African-American physicians and their patients. And by February, 1906, these rooms were officially designated, quote, the colored department in the Protestant hospital. And the black residents of Jonesboro announced their election of the officers chosen to run it. Uh, one of whom was Dr. E. Zell, who was the only black physician listed in Jonesboro directories at the time. And the available of a hospital specifically affiliated with the Protestant denominations of Jonesboro um, helped the Olivet and Benedictine sisters um, to assert their control over St. Bernard's. Uh, despite their assertion of independence, however, the sisters still did graciously recognize um, Protestant white physicians' help, and they still welcomed them to St. Bernard's with their patients, promising to, quote, do our best to satisfy the reasonable demands and, of physicians and patients. And significantly, the sisters declared that, uh, quote, the full control of St. Bernard's Hospital shall now be ours exclusively. Uh, so as you can imagine, with a 21-member board of directors, there was a lot of infighting um, from the beginning. But despite these leadership issues, Oak Home Sanitarium was still operating successfully enough in March 1906 to allow for proposals of a new addition. However, by August, uh, board members determined that the hospital would have to close due to its mounting debt. So on August 16th, 1906, which was only about eight months after opening, uh, the stockholders and directors of Oak Home Sanitarium decided that it should cease operation and be closed. Uh, there was a brief expression of hope for the hospital salvation in October when a Dr. G.W. Parker from St. Louis decided to lease the building and continue to run it as a sanitarium. But this attempt didn't last long either. And the hospital board of directors eventually sold the property to the Jonesboro School Board who raised the existing structure in order to construct a new high school building. Uh, several Jonesboro citizens had taken stock in the Protestant hospital after its initial incorporation for $11,000, and they ultimately lost out when the institution had acquired a $4,000 debt, again, within the span of eight months. Uh, Oak Home Sanitarium stockholders experienced financial issues um, over the loss of this investment as late as July 1907. And following the Protestant hospital's demise, Jonesboro physicians returned to staff St. Bernard's. Uh, there weren't any new attempts to actually establish a Protestant hospital to rival St. Bernard's until the summer of 1919. And the proponents for this effort included those same parties, the local physicians and Protestant ministers and business leaders who supported Oak Home Sanitarium until it failed in 1906. And this idea did meet with some early enthusiasm, but ultimately Jonesboro residents decided to build a new hotel instead and figured that was the better investment. So as a result, 
St. Bernard's was the only operating hospital in Jonesboro until NEA Baptist Memorial Hospital was established in the 1970s. Uh, next slide, please. So throughout Oak Home Sanitarium's short existence, uh, the Olivet and Benedictine Sisters continued to successfully provide care to patients of all races and religious denominations at St. Bernard's Hospital. Um, despite their own expenses and a constant shortage of funds, the sisters continued to find ways to fund their hospital and, to, and continued to expand the facilities to accommodate both the growing population of Jonesboro, as well as the growing number of patients needing medical care. Uh, we're on the next slide, Tim, if you can hear me. Thank you. Uh, the sisters even made sure, uh, again, that they stayed current with formal medical training as it evolved over the course of the early 20th century. Uh, for example, in response to an increased emphasis on professionalism, Sister Hilda Gabler and Sister Pia Weiss were sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Lafayette, Indiana to receive training as registered nurses. And they were there from 1912 to 1914. Uh, when they returned to Jonesboro, uh, Sister Pia and Sister Hilda instructed the other sisters who worked at St. Bernard's in proper uh, methods of nursing procedure for the time, uh, which resulted in the establishment of the first nurses training school, which uh, initially was exclusively for sisters in Jonesboro. Um, the nurses training school came as part of a July 1919 expansion of St. Bernard's, which, which also included a new department for obstetrics, uh, the nece necessary operating rooms, a laboratory, an x-ray department, and also um, more beds. And these new nursing lessons were supplemented with information about medical sciences provided by several doctors in Jonesboro. And uh, the school was actually opened to young unmarried secular ladies in 1920. So St. Bernard's Nurses Training School offered a three-year program that included classes in anatomy and physiology, uh, bacteriology and hygiene, physical education, dietetics, uh, surgical nursing and gynecology, obstetrics and pediatrics, psychology and moral ethics, mental and nervous nursing, emergency nursing and first aid, and physiotherapy, among several other choices. And this expansive curriculum offered by St. Bernard's Nurses Training School actually illustrates the growing importance of nursing in the medical field as a result of the increased role of hospitals during this period and their evolution from charity institutions to nonprofit community institutions organized to help people recover from disease. In June 1921, the St. Bernard's Nurses Training School was officially chartered by the Arkansas State Board of Education and Accreditation. And in December of the same year, uh, the training school graduated its first class of nurses, including its first secular nurse, um, Anna Hughes from Texarkana. Uh, members of this first graduating class passed their state board exam in 1922. And that same year, St. Bernard's Hospital received a Class A rating by the American College of Surgeons Examiners. Um, another newly constructed hospital annex opened on April 15, 1923. And this replaced all but one of the original frame buildings and included the hospital's first elevator as well as a classroom and dining area for the young ladies in the nurses training program. And uh, 
those students in the program were also provided housing on campus in that original 1900 hospital building. Uh, St. Bernard's uh, Nurses Training School continued to successfully produce fully certified nurses and passed inspection by the Inspector of Nurses Training Schools in September 1930. And despite the hardships of, of the Great Depression, students continue to enroll in that program throughout the decade. Uh, with the advent of the Second World War, St. Bernard's Nurses Training School became a cadet corps, um, as we can see in the next slide, a couple of pictures of those ladies. And many graduates serve with the Veterans Administration in Army hospitals at home and abroad. Uh, St. Bernard's Nurses Training School continued to operate until the spring of 1952 when the National Accreditation Association for Nursing Schools issued new regulations that required all nursing courses to be held on a collegiate basis. And so because of those new like, regulations, uh, the association would no longer approve St. Bernard's Nursing School's issuance of diplomas. So this kind of created a little bit of a vacuum in nursing education in Northeast Arkansas until roughly 1966, when the agricultural school uh, created 10 pre-professional programs, including one for nursing, in addition to the two-year programs on the junior college level that were already offered. So uh, students in this new, uh, nursing programs were still required to attend an institution in another location in order to receive adequate training for their state nursing board examinations until the agricultural school achieved university status in 1966. Uh, once this happened, Arkansas State University established a collaborative relationship with the Olivet and Benedictine Sisters and St. Bernard's, which led to the establishment of an associate degree program in nursing in August 1968. And then the next year, the Arkansas State Board of Nursing approved a division of nursing with a bachelor's degree program at Arkansas State. And um, the collaboration continued and Sister Elaine Willett and Sister Gregory or Patricia Lee Finley instructed nursing courses in that program. And students in the program participated in clinical training at St. Bernard's Hospital, and many went on to work at St. Bernard's after graduating and passing their state board examinations. Uh, so again, the next slide is a couple of pictures of the uh, cadet, uh, nurses cadet four. And then now we're on the final slide. <laughs> uh, we lost you. Um, so Arkansas State University's nursing program, um, as you all know, continues to assign student clinical rotations at St. Bernard's Regional Medical Center, as it's known today. And Jonesboro is now a noted center for healthcare in Arkansas, thanks in large part to the efforts of the Olivet and Benedictine sisters who elected to take on healthcare ministry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. That was very interesting. I'm sorry, I kept, my Wi-Fi is not very good tonight, so I kept getting bumped off and coming back on, but. Uh, I understand. <laughs> thank you very much. I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, um, someone asked earlier about whether the, the sisters were instrumental in uh, founding a St. Paul's school in Pocahontas. I believe they were. I think that was the school, that was their original mission that brought them to Northeast Arkansas uh, because there wasn't a, a small established Catholic population in Pocahontas that needed um, those services. And then uh, another question is, uh, have you heard anything or have you 
uh, come across in your research about a flu epidemic in 1900 going on at the same time in Northeast Arkansas? Um, not that I recall, but honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if there was. Again, uh, the spinal meningitis and the malaria epidemics were happening roughly around the same time uh, that inspired the establishment of both uh, St. Anna's and St. Bernard's. So again, I'm sorry, I don't recall uh, seeing any information about the flu epidemic, but I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised either. We have a, a few um, comments. Um, the prioress at, at Holy Angels uh, said that the sisters have fulfilled the role in education, and that's that's especially true. And uh, my mom, they actually they ran Holy Angels Academy in Jonesboro for for many many years. My mom graduated from the academy in 1947, and um, then schools in Texas, I believe, and and maybe Missouri as well. And then they also say that going back to St. Paul's School, they say in Pocahontas. Um, and after another order of Catholic nuns left Pocahontas, um, I guess they took over uh, St. Okay. Paul's. Um, and then we have a question, was the sister's initial reluctance to provide health care services reflective of other Catholic women religious in the U.S.? In other words, did many Catholic women religious in the United States end up in health care by necessity rather than by design? Um... I want to say it was a mix. And for, please forgive me and don't quote me if I'm, I'm wrong on this. Uh, but from what I can recall, um, there, there were instances where there were Catholic women religious who had um, kind of a healthcare min ministry, I guess, kind of from the beginning or they, they were willing to take it on anyway. And then there were other instances where it came out of a necessity um, because of those epidemics. Mm -hmm. The, the prioress, uh, she answered, responded yes to that okay. question as you were, as you were talking. So, Thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm glad to have uh, the convent uh, yes. online, on, <laughs> online with us today uh, or tonight. Um, and she also mentioned um, that the, uh, Olivetans did answer, they answered Father Vibel's request for German-speaking sisters uh, oh, okay. to come into Northeast Arkansas. That would uh, make sense. And uh, of course, St. Bernard's in Jonesboro, I'm, we have uh, someone who says they were born in St. Bernard's in, uh, in the mid-50s. And um, I would imagine there are, there are a lot of people in Northeast Arkansas, Jonesboro and the surrounding areas who can say that they were born at St. Bernard's. I was born in St. Bernard's or at St. Bernard's, and my mom worked at, at the hospital uh, for a while after she graduated from the academy. Um, someone um, uh, has a question. Can you talk a little bit about the archives you're drawing on for this project? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Thank you for it. So a lot of the information is actually from local newspapers. Uh, so I very heavily used um, the America's Historical Newspapers database that I had access through or access to through Arkansas State when I was there. This was actually part of my master's thesis. And then I also um, took a couple trips out to Holy Angels Convent and the sisters were kind enough to host me and speak with me a little bit there um, and tell me a little bit about their own history and research that they had done in their archives. Um, uh, uh, Father Weibel had written, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing names, by the way. Um, there was a memoir that he had written that I also drew from. And then also um, Sister Boss and Sister Hockle had written manuscripts, uh, secondary source manuscripts that I drew from as well, especially for a lot of this context. But the information about the Oak Home Sanitarium specifically, I found that as original research in uh, local Jonesboro newspapers. 
Thank you. Um, and I think Sister uh, Agnes Vaughn, her book is uh, Green Olive Branch, uh, I believe. And then I can't remember what Sister uh, Henrietta Hockles, the title of her book uh, was. I can't either. Oh, it's on my yeah. bookshelf. Yeah. Uh, the sisters provided me copies. Mm -hmm. But Sister Henrietta Hockles, she was a great uh, historian and, and she wrote a lot of history about Northeast Arkansas on high ground by Sister Henrietta Hockles. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for uh, refreshing my memory on that. Well, if we don't have any other questions, we'll wait a few minutes. Um, but Monica, again, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. And uh, I learned a lot um, uh, about holy angels that I didn't know in St. Bernard's. Um, another comment, Sister Henry, Henrietta was also the superintendent of Catholic schools of Arkansas for many years. So Sister Henrietta wore a lot of hats throughout her yes. long <laughs> career uh, and life and uh, and um, but I don't if there if you have any questions please put them in the chat box if not I'm gonna uh, remind you again about December 3rd we'll have a uh, Little Rock architect Charlie Pennix talking about uh, some of the UAMS buildings that uh, Cromwell architect engineers have been involved in and Monica, again, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you all for joining in tonight. This has been recorded and it will be put up on the website. Um, I'll, I'll type my uh, email address in the chat box. So if you have any questions, please email me and I will uh, look for this presentation probably going up in the next couple of weeks or so. So thank, thank you, you all again uh, for being here and we look forward to seeing you on December 3rd for the next one. Thank you. Stay safe.